Hello and welcome to week two of Configuration Management, a short course facilitated by IT Masters and ITPA, or Information Technology Professionals Association, presented by Mike Giavarella. My name is Guy, your course MC, and this week Mike will take us through some coding examples. Sorry for the delayed start, we just had a, a couple of minor technical issues which we're, we've managed to sort out now, thankfully. Uh, also tonight, uh, the president of ITPA, Robert Hudson, will be joining us um, to answer any questions you may have about ITPA uh, and after a brief discussion of, of who they are. Uh, Mia Stone will, as usual, be around uh, in case of technical issues uh, and, and answering any questions that you might have about courses. Um, speaking about questions, as always, send them in via the chat function, um, general questions or questions uh, concerning the presentations of either Robert or Mike, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll get to them in the forums. Um, so keep posting in the forums as well. Uh, for now, welcome Robert, uh, the president of ITPA. Some of you may remember him from his previous course. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you, Michael, Mia, and course attendees. So just very briefly, what we wanted to do was take the opportunity to say thank you for attending this course and, and to give you a very brief introduction about ITPA, who we are, what we stand for, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, as you may notice in the slides, this is from October last year, this presentation uh, from when I ran the vSphere 6 master course. So a very quick word about us, who we are. So we are a membership-based association representing IT professionals uh, within Australia and, and overseas. So we are led by IT professionals who are currently working in the industry. What that means is that the, the board of the organisation, myself, the Vice President, the Secretary and the other board members, we are all volunteers. We Our, our full-time jobs are in the IT industry and we volunteer to run the ITPA to provide services back to our members. Uh, as a result of that, we believe we are in tune with the latest industry developments and that we are a vibrant organisation, we are innovative, we are constantly involved in deploying services and solutions in the industry, and we are excited about the IT industry. Uh, you know, it, it is our passion, it is our, it is our career, uh, and we, we are very, uh, very interested in what goes on and, and how we can deliver IT services uh, within society, to government, to industry, and to community. We are as a member service focused on growing the career opportunities for Australian IT professionals in particular. So we, in recent times, you may have seen some press around the 457 visa program being uh, shut down by the federal government, being replaced with a temporary skills shortage visa system. We have commented on that. We have actually put in some freedom of information requests around the 457 visa program because we had some concerns that it was being abused uh, to the detriment of both local and foreign workers. And we are absolutely willing to challenge government policy that inhibits the growth of the Australian IT industry and our challenging of the 457 visa system uh, and some comments we've made about the MBN are two recent examples of how we've gone about doing that. So there are three tiers of membership really uh, within the organisation. The first tier is a free tier and, and as attendees of this uh, short course, you have been granted the free tier of membership within the ITPA that is our associate membership. So that gives you no voting rights on, on uh, issues that the organisation is dealing with, but gives you access to, you know, some limited access to ITPA services, but it does certainly mean that we are out there representing you as IT workers in, in the industry. As a financial member, that is a paid membership, uh, on any matters of, of organisational importance that we, we vote on, each member receives a vote. You are also able to stand for the board uh, and we provide further membership uh, benefits to financial members. On top of that, and associated with these short courses, we have what we call our certified practicing member level. And that is, again, it's a paid membership, so you pay the same amount for that as you pay for a standard mem uh, financial membership. But we are effectively recognizing then the fact that you have taken the time and made the effort to increase your education, to learn further, to study harder, and to improve your ability to deliver IT services to community, to industry, and to government, and to society as a whole. We then do have a life membership tier. That is a free membership that we grant to members who have shown a significant and prolonged, um, what would I say, dedication to the organization. So, so people who have served on boards, or served on working parties, or put significant uh, effort and time into advancing the organization. 
Now the paid membership is a $165 per year or less than a cup of, a cup of coffee a week effectively, plus we do have a $30 joining fee which covers some administrative overheads in, in onboarding you into our, uh, our membership and also providing some member services back to you as you, you join. So I mentioned the CPM. Uh, some of you who are old enough to remember what CPM was may catch the little joke in this one, but it is our certified practicing member level. Uh, so you need to um, you need to pass an ITPA short course with a minimum credit grade to qualify. Once you qualify, you need to maintain 20 professional development units or PDUs per year to maintain your CPM status. Each short course, I believe, is worth 10 PDUs. So as long as you pass the short course and you actually achieve the certification at the end of the short course, you will uh, and do two of those per year, you would be able to, and sorry, it does say 10 points for a short course, you will maintain CPM status. We do recognize other uh, educational and, and exam, so we recognize relevant university degrees, we recognize vendor certifications, uh, we recognize presenting to your peers in some ways in order to achieve PDUs. Now the long-term aim of our CPM program is to establish the ITPA CPM as the IT industry equivalent of a CPA in the accountancy program, in the accountancy field, sorry. So in the accountancy field, in the financial industry, a, a lot of people will ask for a CPA almost as a, a default requirement for financial roles where a CPA probably isn't technically required, but the CPA program is so well recognized that it's become almost synonymous with jobs in, in the, certainly the accountancy field. How can you become involved with the ITPA? So, Become an associate member, and as people studying this course, you've been granted associate membership, so for that, thank you. Uh, we think it's important that you continue your education, and, and we are happy to recognize that. Please think of becoming a paid member. As I said, it's a cup of coffee a week. That allows us to represent you, allows you to participate more um, readily in the organization, allows us to provide you with more membership services. Please also pass the word, talk about ITPA. If you think we're offering something good, say so. If you think there's something we should offer, say so. Tell your friends, your relatives, your pets, etc. cetera. Uh, I've said it a few times, I don't think we have any four-legged members as yet. I don't think it'll happen anytime soon given we have a requirement for members to be a natural person, but please tell people about us. Um, if you think we're doing the wrong thing, tell us. If you think you're, you're, that we're doing the right thing, tell everybody. At this point, uh, I'd be happy to either take questions now or Mike, if you'd rather we did questions at the end, I'd be happy to do that as well. No, we'll go some questions um, now, I reckon. Mike, what do you reckon? Keep yeah, it fresh. Why not? Uh, we've got a comment from Luke um, saying that he's going to register his dog. It's a natural person, so thank you, Luke. We can finally tick that off the list <laughs> for ITPA. Um, not too many questions, I think, the, it was pretty self-explanatory. Um, but Robert, perhaps a question for me is what, what sort of uh, uh, things do you think will be, uh, is there anything coming up uh, in the near future that you guys would be interested in, in talking about or anything we can, we can tout? Certainly one thing we, we recently did was along with Linux Australia, uh, with Telco, uh, Telco, Telsoc, I need to be very careful with the way I say that word in the future. And also the industry, the Internet Industry Association, we have formed a group called the Beyond 2020 Alliance. And certainly one of the, the core reasons for the existence of that alliance is to discuss the future of broadband in Australia beyond 2020. The reason we're saying 2020 is that that is the nominal delivery date for the current MBN plans. And what we're really looking at is removing the politicalization um, of the issue of national broadband networks, and I use that as a generic term, not a specific one for the NBN, but then to comment on the technical and the social aspects without having a political slant. So we're not looking at uh, perpetuating the political position of, of a particular party uh, or, or of a particular group. We are not a, a, a group that plans to um, go and petition political parties to, to meet our particular interests. We are, are looking to advocate for good policy, good technology and social policy around the NBN. We certainly believe that we 
offer, along with Linux Australia Inter uh, Industry Association and TELSOC, offer a level of expertise in the issues around the NBN that uh, have been sorely lacking in policy development in the past, and we are hoping to push our involvement in the future to drive better outcomes. Beauty, uh, and a question from Maria uh, about the procedure of becoming a paid up yep. member. Is, so, there, so is there a place that people can go to? There certainly is. So if you go to www.itpa.org.au, there is a membership uh, link there and you can sign up from there. Uh, as a attendee of this course, you already have an associate membership. You should have been given a, uh, a reset link to reset your account. And once you log into the website, if you can go in and pay for financial membership via that my, uh, sorry, it's via a different link, sorry, it's via the My ITPA link that will appear once you log in. If you're having issues with logging in, please feel free to email info at itpa.org.au and you will be provided with assistance. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Robert. Nice to hear from you again. Um, are you going to stick around for the presentation? I am. I'm attending this course. I yeah. uh, need to meet my CPD points so I can achieve the <laughs> CPM. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, perhaps we'll move on and get into Mike's presentation. Thanks again, Robert. Um, we'll maybe talk to you later on. Thank you kindly. Thanks, Rob. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning to many of you. Uh, welcome to week two of the configuration management class. Um, I'm going to just flip to the correct screen here. And um, Guy, that's showing up on your end. Sure is. Yep. yep. Excellent. Do, do you have, we've got a couple of polls. When do you want to go with them? Um, let's have a quick look at those polls. Um, let's start the first one now, please. Okay. So everyone, how far did you get with last week's exercises? And thanks also for the feedback about uh, the makeup of the questions for the polls last week that that will help us going forward. Something to continue to thinking about. Okay, how's this poll looking? All right, so we've had a couple of questions uh, through the week and a little bit of feedback, so I wanted to address that uh, early on. There are no weekly quizzes in this class. There is just an exam in week five. Um, so you do not have to worry about completing a quiz each week um, as you have in previous ITP8 classes. This one is a little bit different. There were a number of questions that we didn't get to in last week's webinar. Um, so I've attempted to answer as many of those as I can. The responses have been uploaded. There's a PDF in the additional reading section. We believe we have figured out what the annoying clicking was in last week's recording. Um, that's the one. It was me. Sorry, um, folks. It was Nervous guy. tick. Nervous tick on my, <laughs> uh, on my microphone. Yes. Well, hopefully the, um, the number of times that happens this week will be um, a lot less. Um, okay. So we've had a lot of discussion about the exercises um, and there's, there's a question that's active uh, today. Um, did the week one homework pages suddenly get more content? Um, the probable answer to that, David, is yes. The course that you're seeing is um, being developed as we go. So there is a little bit of scope for me to change things. Um, and what I'm trying to do is get notes out to you before the webinar time um, and then the exercises within a day or two of that if they're not already done. Um, so we will be updating the book as we go. Just keep, keep in mind that uh, that will happen. And if you have a look at the handbook, uh, in the, 
at the bottom of the left hand page, every page in the handbook, you'll see a revision number. That revision number for this week will be um, 2.0 or 2.1 currently. The first digit is the week number and the second digit is the revision. Um, so there's an easy way to tell if, if you're up to date, grab the latest one and make sure it's got a bigger number than previously. Um, so I think that can tick off our red flag um, question guy. All right, we have a poll that's running. Um, looks like a really good um, number of you have started. Um, we got, uh, this is very odd here. A um, couple of people finished with no problems, a couple with some issues. Um, 13% have finished reading, 16% um, have done everything. It's not a bad result. Right? Re remember that the aim here is learning. So as much as you can get done um, is, is going to be good. It doesn't matter if you can't do everything. Uh, but just keep at it, keep learning, keep reading in particular. Um, Guy, could you flip to the next poll? Um, I've had a couple of bits of feedback in uh, the forums about why AWS. Is it absolutely necessary to have AWS for the exercises? Um, the short answer is it's not absolutely necessary. However, when I've been preparing this class, I needed to make some decisions about how we were going to demonstrate the principles of configuration management. One of those decisions was to choose a platform and that's Ansible. Another one of those decisions was to choose a target, something that we're going to manage. And I could have chosen Windows, but it's not something that I would normally do in Ansible myself once that decision was made. And from what I've seen, more people want to manage Linux with tools like Ansible anyway. Now, remember the principles still apply here, but we do need a platform that's going to to work for exercises, work for learning, and that's that's Linux. Similarly for AWS, I could have chosen Azure or Google Compute Engine or possibly even something like Heroku or DigitalOcean. Um, AWS provided uh, both a, a free service and a service that, that is quite comprehensive and reasonably easy to, to understand. Um, some of the Google Compute stuff can be a little bit odd and Azure, again, it's kind of a little bit different, not a lot. Um, they both have free uh, free versions as well. In the end, it came down to pick one. And so I did choose AWS. You don't have to do the AWS exercises. Um, I would be absolutely ecstatic if you said, Mike, I don't do AWS, I do Azure. And you went and tried to do the same exercises on Azure. I think that would be fantastic for you as a learning experience. Um, unfortunately, when you're preparing a class for a couple of thousand students, um, it's really hard to support all those different platforms. So um, if you have problems, you're going to have to hop on the forums and work with your classmates who are doing a similar thing and try to resolve them that way. Um, if I see a, a question that I have an answer to, I'll certainly answer it. Um, but my main support efforts are going to be aimed at AWS. All right, just quickly, are there any, any questions about that? There's a couple of comments. Um, the question is not about that. Um, Jeffrey's made a comment, target platform. Uh, we should have one such as internal or self-hosted. But other than that, no questions okay. about that. So there are, there are things that you, you can't easily do that are easily done on AWS if you're self-hosting. Um, one of those is uh, bootstrap an image for uh, feeding into something like CloudFront. Um, setting up the infrastructure to do that is just, at, at home, is just way out of scope of the course. Um, I will probably have a look at trying to rewrite some exercises to just use a local virtual box. 
um, but that's going to be dependent on on free time, which there's not a lot of. Okay. Alrighty. So I'll get rid of that right. now. Get into this. Okay. So we talked last week um, about policy, and we we had a reading to uh, to cover um, about promise theory. Uh, actually, a video. Um, and before we actually get to Ansible today, I wanted to talk a little bit about deployment and and actually taking whatever policy you, you develop in a configuration management system and getting it out there, actually having it applied to nodes. It's a pretty simple process, at least at a very high level. You have some policy, you need to get that policy across to your nodes. The nodes apply the policy, or to be more precise, the application of the policy happens on the node and you then complete that loop by measuring the success um, of that application. You know, it's, it's all great to push a, a policy out to have configuration changes made on a node, but you've got to know that they worked. And if there's problems, you really want to know about that early on. If there are problems and you don't have feedback that there are problems happening out there and you, you say you're deploying to 10,000 machines, you run a really good chance of breaking those machines and not knowing. At least if you get feedback, you can count how many failures there have been and decide to stop rolling out if the failure rate is too high. What you're doing when you're pushing your policy out is you're actually expressing intent. You're saying, I want this done. Now that intent isn't as simple as install a patching or you know, install this patch. You're actually thinking a lot bigger picture and it's important that you, you start to do that now. We'll talk later on in, in the class about abstraction. But what you're doing here is you're saying, I have an end goal in mind. This is the way I want you to do it. Please do it. Don't forget that. That intent really is almost a model of your policy or an inverse model if you're thinking that way. Um, your policy is close to your intent. It's an expression of your intent, but it is not your actual intent. Um, I'm sure this will come up in a question. I might have to explain that again. But what you're trying to do here is with your configuration management, you're trying to express what you want to achieve. Your policy should get you most of the way there. You need to know how far you actually got. That's your measurement. Now, if you can see the lines on your slide, the vertical dotted lines, you'll, say, you'll see that they align with um, horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling needs to happen between your master node and your repository of, of policy. What that means is the master node, which is responsible for distributing policy or the master nodes in larger systems, need to be able to pull policy from the repo at the same time. Otherwise, the master nodes become inconsistent. It's a lot less of a problem because you tend to have many fewer master nodes than actual managed nodes but it's still a problem to worry about. When we talk about vertical scaling in deployment, we're talking about the number of actual nodes that you're deploying to. As you get larger, you'll, you'll start to see interesting problems here. If you've got 100,000 nodes, you simply can't deploy changes to all those nodes at the same instant in time. What you're looking for in a deployment is a system that, that is reliable, resilient, 
consistent, secure, and scalable. These are the attributes that config management tools actually differentiate themselves on. You'll find some focus on security, some focus on scalability, some focus on consistency, and so on. We'll have a quick look at, at some models for uh, deployment. These are general models, um, but they help you understand where you might have problems in a config management deployment. Push model is the one we generally all think about as sysadmins. We have a policy, we have a machine, we'll call it the master, and we send our policy out from the master to all our nodes. Now, if we do that, we can process those nodes one at a time, send it to node one, wait for the answer to come back, send it to node two, and so on. And what we'll see is that over time, we'll get an error rate. But until we've got to the last node, we're not going to know how many have failed overall. You know, but we do get an early indication. Unfortunately, if we go sequentially here, one node at a time, this is going to be very slow. You can speed up by running multiple nodes in parallel. But all that will do here is it'll basically um, flatten that graph a little bit. The failure rate won't change because nodes that would fail in single mode will also fail in parallel mode. Um, you may get some earlier alerts, but that depends on which nodes um, are contacted at which time. As you get larger, you're going to note that changes simply happen. If you've got 100,000 servers, it's unlikely that they're all going to be running at the time that you do a push. You may have to reapply the push and reapply it and reapply it until finally you decide no more. We also have a pull model. This is very different. We still have the involvement of a master, but this time, the nodes poll the master for their policy. So when you have a new policy, depending on the polling rate, nodes will see that quite quickly. And they'll all see it at different times within their polling window. So if each node is meant to check every five minutes, generally within 10 minutes, because you may have just missed one, um, all of your nodes will have seen the policy if they're going to. So that will rapidly roll out a change. And once you get to two times the polling interval, then you're going to have a very good idea of what didn't work because they didn't contact you on the master. This is a very different model to pull, uh, to push. The main difference with this model is resource spikes. You're going to have all of those nodes hitting your master server in a small period of time, and if they depend on any common resources, like a network or downloading a file to apply a config, those shared resources are gonna get hammered. They're going to have a bunch of servers hitting them all within that polling interval. That can be a problem in some sites. The coordination here is also very different. How do you stop a change that is failing if you're not in control from the master. It's an interesting problem. Another way to look at deployment is to consider whether you've got a piece of software that stays permanently on the machine, listening for network connections. We call that an agent. And most of the modern config management tools do this. We also have agentless systems. Now, these work without having a dedicated service running on each node, but you still need to handle transfers of policy and execution or application of that policy somewhere. Um, part of the reason that Ansible is so successful is because it's agentless. You don't have to install an agent on every machine. It's very easy to get going, providing you meet two minimum requirements. One is having Python 2.6 or later, and the other is having SSH. 
you know, or WinRM if you're on Windows. There are also considerations similar to the push-pull type models. What are your resource requirements? For a long time, the config management systems written in Ruby had a massive memory requirement compared to something like CF Engine. So they weren't practical to use on IoT type devices. That's slowly changing. If you've got agents, how are you going to manage the agents themselves? Is it easy to push an upgrade out? What happens if the upgrade fails? Have you damaged contact to that machine? What are the security trade-offs? If you've got a service that's listening um, on a machine, specifically for config management, what does that do to your attack surface? How do you quickly determine the current state of a machine if you're agentless? It's very difficult. Finally, how do you actually get this stuff out there? How do you bootstrap? How do you put your agents or your minimum requirements for agentless config management out on the nodes you want to manage. Well, the obvious way is we can run around and manually install the software that we need on every node. This solves a bootstrap problem, but it's not going to solve really anything else other than to make the people who have to do this get really annoyed. Sometimes it's all you can do, but it's definitely not preferred. If you've got an agentless system, then make sure that you deploy with the minimum requirements present. It's easy. You can also cheat. A lot of people will have install servers. They've already gotten some of the way out of ad hoc um, and into the next level. So they'll have a way to build a machine, at least to a base platform. If you take that base platform and make your config management tool a part of the standard install, that's going to give you a whole bunch of wins and it's easy. There's also combinations of these approaches. My preference is this one. Wherever you can, make sure that your config management tools and a sane, simple, minimal base default are installed in any machine that you build without you doing any extra work. Right, this way, you can rely on it always being there. Okay, questions. Okay, so got a screen couple here. questions. Yeah. Um, not too many floating in at the moment, but uh, uh, I'll go back to a couple about uh, the exercises. Um, and then there's one from David as well. Um, Joel has asked about um, the, when, I'll just read the question. When he um, downloaded the exercise stuff last week, half of the material wasn't there. I'm now working to finish it though. Could you perhaps give some insight as to packages contained in the development tools? Meta package, assuming it's a meta package. Um, yes, Joel, it is a meta package. Um, so the types of things in there are compilers and some of the libraries needed um, for um, support of AWS tools, Bodo in particular. Um, and there's a couple of others. You should be able to, there is a, a file that has a list of what's in the meta package. Um, you can certainly have a look at that. It's the reason I gave the meta package was simply it, it's one install versus um, about 25 different dependencies. Um, I was trying to make it easier on you. Okay. Um, Bianca is just given a comment or a question. Um, I was charged about $1.50 uh, by Amazon for AWS, but didn't use anything other than register for free tier. Is that, is that normal? 
Um, one thing that I've noticed Amazon doing is when you register for a service they ask for a credit card um, as a almost like a, a I don't know policy insurance policy they they do an authorization for a small amount nominally a dollar to determine that the card is valid and they then reverse that authorization a couple of days later um, if it's still there in a week then just send Amazon support a call. I'm pretty sure that they'll reverse it. Yeah, getting a couple of comments saying the same. Great. Uh, question from David. Um, where does DSC sit in config management? Does it even qualify? Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't a desired state configuration for those who are uninitiated like me. I had to go back to David and clarify, but yes. Um, so Windows DSC, a PowerShell DSC. Um, okay, so I have not used it. Um, I saw a post in the forum that may well have been from you, David, I'm not sure. Um, and I just haven't had time to, to go in there. Um, what it looks like is it's kind of halfway to being something like Puppet. Um, but I, I'm qualifying this by saying I would need to spend a couple of hours playing with it to be able to give you an honest opinion. Um, I, I will say up front that uh, PowerShell and the team that developed PowerShell did a really nice job. If any of that team has been involved in developing DSC, then there's a good chance that it's going to be really good for Windows. And from the sounds of it, don't other discount people, it yet. <laughs> from the sounds of it, other people have been thinking the same thing because it wasn't David in the in the forums, apparently. Ah, okay. Uh, cool. A couple more questions. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a qualified answer here, David. It does qualify, <laughs> but it, where where it gets you to, that's going to be a hard question. James has a question about the agentless approach. Um, he's wondering whether sure. the dependency of Ansible and Python effectively, isn't the dependency of Ansible and Python effectively the agent? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, but there's a difference. So you, you can't get away with not having any software on the other end. The question is, what software do you need? The absolute minimum that you need is something for communication and something for execution. Now, if you look at an agent-based system, all right, you'll have a Puppet Master D and um, that will handle your comms and your top-level execution, and then there's some other processes under that. Um, you know, you, you can't escape this, at least if, if you want to be able to do some kind of interactive or um, non-static config management. You just can't get around those base minimums. So I guess my question back to you is, is that too much? Is Python and Ansible, or sorry, Python and SSH too much? For Unix machines, I don't think so. SSH is the de facto standard for for comms for management. It's pretty much always there. Python, less of a standard, um, but we had the same problem with Perl many years ago, and nowadays you have minimal installs of one or the other on a machine. When it gets down to it. If you can't have anything other than Bash and SSH, you're probably not going to get the wins that you need to get in that environment. And I, I have worked in environments where you simply couldn't install other software. And even to the point of, um, you know, you weren't allowed to change the default configurations that came from the manufacturer because um, then it wouldn't be supported. And you know, they're hard environments to work in, but it's worth the effort to get approval 
to install the other software and to make those config changes. It really is worth the effort. Sorry, long answer for a short question. No, that's all right. Uh, maybe just one more then. Uh, a question from Manuel. Um, apart from being agent uh, slash agentless, what's what's the difference in approach uh, of Chef or Puppet um, and Ansible, given they're the most used tools in the trade? Okay. Um, ignoring agent and agentless. The language, the DSL that's in play is very different. Um, Puppet uses uh, properties. Um, Chef uses, um, I can't think of the right word, but basically uses um, methods to achieve the same kind of thing. Um, it's very easy to extend Chef and Puppet within Lion Ruby if you absolutely have to. It's less easy to extend Ansible with inline Python. Um, the the learning curve for Ansible, from what I've seen, seems to be a lot quicker to learn um, to be reasonably productive with Ansible than to be reasonably productive with Chef and Puppet, especially for non-programmers. If you're in a Ruby shop, absolutely make sure that you check out Chef and Puppet before you check out Ansible, right? Because you're not going to be wearing that hit of needing to learn Ruby to do any, any fancy stuff. Okay, uh, might just use the last questions uh, in the next bracket, um, if you want to keep going. Sure. Okay. So let's just get back onto the slides. All right, so let's let's look at Ansible. Um, it's open source, yay. Um, it's mostly written in Python, yay. There are little bits of PowerShell in there. Um, if you're using some of the Windows modules, um, you'll need to uh, make sure that you do have PowerShell available um, at the end of WinRM pipes. Um, Ansible is reasonably generic. It can manage Linux, Unix, variants, Windows, even network devices and some weird stuff that you wouldn't normally think about like um, switches and temperature monitors. It has plenty of modules for configuring specific software installation types, um, you know, whether you use apt or yum or package ng or um, you know whatever suits MSIs. Um, different types of files are handled easily. Um, you, you can handle services, you can manage cloud providers. Um, a couple of third party uh, as a service providers have also got modules that allow you to control their service. Provisioning is, is really nicely done. If you get into Ansible, it's actually reasonably easy to write your own modules and plugins. Um, the docs are, are good. The, the bulk of Ansible itself is written using its own plugin infrastructure, which is kind of cool. Um, makes it very easy to maintain, very easy to debug. Um, overall, Ansible is just easy to get started. The main catch is you've got to have SSH um, installed and working. Um, I'm just going to set through some terminology here. Um, some of the terminology that Ansible uses is a little bit fluid, um, in particular when it comes to um, plays and roles and role books. So these are the terms in the, well, I'm presenting these in the way I'd like you to think of them. Okay. Um, you know, first of all, this should look vaguely familiar, very similar to the master, um, master node and controlled node, sorry, managed node of a push deployment system. Um, we have an inventory. Now, inventory is kind of central to Ansible. An inventory is a list of all of the potential nodes 
that you might manage. Now, you could have different inventories. You could have an inventory for your development machines and an inventory for production and an inventory for production in a particular data center or a particular country. But when you apply a playbook, its context is one inventory. So you have to apply the playbook to the right inventory. Just keep that in mind if, if you've got a lot of hosts to manage um, and you want to split inventories. And it also includes, inventory also includes settings that are specific to nodes and groups of nodes. Um, we'll have a look at that momentarily. Each node will eventually have associated with it a set of facts, information about that node. You can switch this off, um, but it makes things a lot faster if you do collect the facts generally over time. There's just an example of some of the facts that you might pull off a machine. Um, you'll notice that the structure there is JSON. Um, and it's just strings. It's nice and easy. Translates straight into, um, well, we get to access it directly with the Python and the standard notation in Python of dots and square brackets to walk down the tree of variables. Ansible uses a, um, can't remember the proper word, but it uses a model of what it's doing, um, thinking of sports and um, strategies and, and playbooks. So a playbook is really simple. It's a collection of plays. A play is a combination of some hosts and some roles. And in a particular play, those roles are applied to those hosts. A role is just a set of tasks, possibly some other things like handlers and any other support files, so templates and you know, files that you want to copy from your master to your managed node. Right? They all get kept together in a role. So, if you're thinking about how you'd grow an Ansible installation, roles are the key. If you define a role, you can apply that to one machine or to many. You just have to define which hosts. So when you're thinking about your Ansible designs, you need to start thinking about what is a role? Is it as simple as a web server? Or is it a database server or you know, do you want to think about a role as you know a machine that has a certain property so it might have a database server um, it might have this particular package installed right, this is this is the main reuse abstraction within Ansible to keep things easy consistent um, Ansible defines a standard layout. This is a file system layout. Now you'll notice I've got my inventory off to the side here. Um, that's deliberate. It doesn't, inventory doesn't have to be in the same file system or in the same uh, hierarchy as a playbook, but it generally will be for static anyway. Each of these folders or directories um, has a very specific purpose. And you'll also notice that some of them are, are duplicated at the role level and at the playbook level. The general rule of thumb that you should think about is the closer to the bottom of this diagram you are, um, that's the value that will be used. So if, if you are looking in um, variables, one of the variables uh, folders here, a variable in the vars at the bottom would override this a variable of the same name out of host vars. That precedence will become important. Now, all of those uh, pink directories 
contain YML files, YAML. YAML is a markup language. It's um, YAML ain't markup or something like that. It's in your notes. It is a text-based language um, and it gets it structured through indentation. And this can be a bit of a bit of a nuisance if you're not used to it. Um, because if you get the indentation wrong, Ansible will get confused. You need to make sure that you choose an editor that doesn't mix tabs and spaces. Stick with one or the other, not both. By convention, YAML files end in .yml. It's not strictly required, but Ansible does expect it um, in a couple of places. So let's have a look at some YAML. It's pretty easy. Variable names on the left, followed by a colon. Values to the right of the colon. So we have a string value on the top line here. Um, it's double quoted. In some cases, you can get away without the quotes. I would strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that you use the quotes wherever you, you think you might need to. On our second line, we see a numeric value. That also doesn't need to be quoted, but it won't hurt if you do. Ansible will handle that just fine. If it doesn't, if a module has problems with that, um, that's a, a bug that you need to, to uh, lodge against that module. YAML also has the ability to, um, thankfully, have lists and dictionaries. These are more complex data structures. You can think of a list as uh, an array, almost. Um, you can think of dictionaries as an associative array, um, an array that's keyed by um, something that's not necessarily a number. And these are these are pretty common. What you're seeing on the screen now will generally get you through most of um, understanding YAML variables. Not all of it. There's uh, another example in your notes that you should have a have a look at. All right. So we mentioned inventory earlier. Inventory is easy, right? It's basically just a list of hosts and some groups of those hosts and some settings. Now Ansible's kind of nifty in that you can start easy with a file that has your inventory in it. And then when you get a lot larger, you can move to um, dynamic inventory, which is taking inventory from an outside source um, at the time that you need to figure out what's in the inventory. So as an example of that, you can point Ansible at your VMware vSphere um, clusters and you can say to Ansible, give me a list of all the VMs that are configured in this cluster. Give me a list of all the VMs that are configured um, on this node. And you can then apply policy or your playbooks to hosts that meet whatever criteria you're after. Now, it's important to just keep in mind here that you know, just because you have a machine defined in one group, that doesn't mean it can't be defined in another group or multiple groups at the same time. This is kind of cool because it means that you can start to think about machines very abstractedly. For now, I'm going to have one machine, which is a web server and a database server and a DNS server. Later, I can split those roles out. And I can do it simply by splitting them, splitting the inventory entry from one machine with three classes or three groups into three machines. And that's kind of cool. This is an example of a very simple static inventory file. It looks just like a Windows any file. It is an any file. The name of the first uh, group is testing and that group contains one host 
called testrunner.example.com. And because that's a special machine, we've actually got a host variable uh, specified for that particular machine. If you quickly flip back to the standard layout, that host variable could also have been stored in a host vars file, right? A file with the name testrunner.example.com in the host vars folder. So you get a choice here. You can put variables in inventory or you can put them in variable files in the appropriate folder. Our second group is called production. What's interesting about this group is it automatically expands that numeric pattern in between the square brackets. So that production actually has six hosts in the group, www.example.com all the way through to www.06.example.com. Really handy if you have a lot of machines that are pretty much going to be the same. The next group is another simple group. It only has one computer in it, one manage node. But the next group, this is kind of interesting. This creates a new group called dev. And dev is actually a union of the Jenkins group and the testing group. So what we actually have here is a group of groups that group gets flattened. So when you reference dev in any of your playbooks as a group, um, anything that was duplicated in Jenkins or testing, there's nothing here, of course, um, in this example, but anything that was duplicated would be reduced to just a single copy. Um, now, in this case, dev will have the Jenkins host in it and it will have the testing host in it. So there'll be two hosts in the dev group. If we look under that definition, there are some variables for that dev group. Every host in that dev group will have SSH port equals 8222 as a variable assigned to it. All right, when we use it in the dev context. So if we were applying a playbook or a play to Jenkins, would it have SSH port? No. Right, the variables apply to the group. So you need to be using the group. Dynamic inventory. Really easy, because you already know what you're pointing it at. And this is how you use dynamic inventory. You run your playbook, very simply with a minus I flag and the name of a script, which sources your dynamic inventory. Now this is, there are other ways to do this. This is the canonical way, just purely to, to show you what's happening. And if you have a look in your notes, you'll see um, some sample output from running that script. What's really neat is it's easy to tell if your dynamic inventory has got a, a hope of working because you can just run the script by itself and watch its output. All right, there are plenty of modules in Ansible and in Ansible a module is a pre-configured bit of code that lets you manage a particular type of thing on a node. There's literally hundreds of these modules. Um, most of them are pretty good, but not all of them. In particular, you'll find that a lot of people are, are very generous and write a module for their own purpose and make it available on, on GitHub. But it's very specific to, to their purpose and it might not be using current standards for layout or conventions, best practices. Um, so there's a little bit of work to get it going reliably in your own environment. That's okay, that's part of the fun of Ansible.
Now, I could keep going on slides like this, but I thought I'd try something a little bit different. This may not work. This may crash and burn. Um, for those people who have been in IT for a while, please um, pray to the uh, demo gods. That's always a good start, Mike. <laughs> this <laughs> may not work. Um, all right, so sharing. I'm going to try this. Okay. Is that showing Guy? Yes, I can see it. Yes. Is it clear? Yes, it's quite clear. Okay. It's looking quite nice in fact. Okay. Awesome. Um just testing here. You can see both pointy fingers or not? No. No. All right, let's just, okay. Oh, yep, there's one. Apologies, everyone. This is just oh, that's, yep, one that's... of the little things we've got to sort out here. I just saw the, um, the innermost points of your thumbs. Oops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> um, this is all very <laughs> new. There's some, there's some fun comments coming in. <laughs> uh, from Luke reminds me of Bill Gates blue screen. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Luke. <laughs> we'll get to a couple uh, of questions let's... now. Um, while we're going, yeah. Along. So while I'm setting this up, just if, guy, yep. if you want to read a question, um, at me. yep. Alexandra has asked about the handbook being available at the end of the course. Um, uh, that essentially is um, going to be when you compile the, all of the study guides for the weeks, you can just combine them. And I think in the last week, it'll just be available as a as the handbook. Yeah, the, the book is growing over time. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe. Oh, and, and a note on these comments, um, which I get every every week. It's not a true chat forum um, in GoToWebinar. I can see all of the, the comments that you type in, um, but you will not be able to see those comments unless I respond to them in text, which is why I often say, for example, Alexandros, Alexandros has, has asked a question. I just, um, I can start sharing them, but it might be a bit labor intensive. Um, so so any any messages? That you do type in, I can see, uh, and and others won't be able to see unless I respond in text. Okay. Um, I think that's going to be the best I can get it. Is that legible, guy? I can't see anything. There we go. How's that? Okay. Great. Awesome. Can see. All right. So this is what we started off with. Uh, fingers crossed. I'm just going to get some borders right here. Awesome. Okay. So let's have a look at an example. The slide that I just had up. Um, I'll give you a few moments to actually very quickly um, try to go to this web page or just. Um, Clone it if, if you're out there, get clone of, of that URL. Take a few moments. All right, so this is somebody else's Ansible role. Um, I've chosen this role because a couple of people have talked about Jenkins, and this role helps you get Jenkins running on a machine without a lot of work. So you still have to configure Jenkins, but this gets you most of the way there. So you could become quite productive quickly. All right. So we are going to start with
defaults. We're just looking in a role for now. Defaults contain default variable values. Any variable in a role should have a default. There are ways to, to deal with um, values that are missing um, or that don't have a default, but really, um, just for, for best practice, if you define a variable anywhere else in a role, it should be in defaults first. All right, so let's have a look at the structure of a variable file, um, it's YAML. Um, you'll see the start of data item here. Comments. Comments are good. Comments are very good. Now, one thing you'll see, um, unfortunately, the font got messed about on this. So, spacing. That's just a marker for a line wrap from the previous line. And you'll see that there's no number there. Just to let you know, Mike, okay. there's a, a bit of a lag in, in, in refresh rate, but uh, it, it's workable. Sure. Thank you. All right. So we have some, some good comments here. And because that's the kind of person I am, comments, fantastic. All right. Um, we're actually going to grade this, this role as we go. We have a couple of variables. Um, what's really nice about this is that these variables have a consistent naming pattern. They all start with Jenkins. All right, so we've got tick on the comments. Um, we have a tick on naming scheme. That's excellent. And if you have a look at the variables, let's try this again. There we go. The names of those variables are very clear. There's none of these, you know, I or J. They all have very, very obvious names. Um, so we're just going to give. Creds here, props to this role, this uh, variable file. Okay. Now, just going to zip up a little bit here. I know it's going to lag a small amount. Something that we don't talk about in the slides um, is where do you put things like passwords, because you don't really want passwords to be stored in a repository if you can avoid it. Um, Ansible does have a way to deal with this, Ansible Vault. Um, there are other systems for dealing with this using environment variables and so on. Um, but you still need to generally have same defaults. So I'm gonna give that one a half mark. And I'm going right. to jump in here, Mike, and say it may not yes. have just been me uh, with the clicking. We've got some more clicking. Are you playing with your texture? Like this? Yeah. Like that? Yep. Yes. Written Sorry apology? R written apology? Uh, I don't know. Something, some kind of recompense for your scurrilous accusations at the, at the start of the lecture? Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let people decide. Might put a poll up later. There's one written apology guy. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Welcome. All right. So let's get back to our defaults file. Um, and we have a, a little more complex variable here. Um, it's a list of um, values. And you'll notice that, in fact, we're just going to have to be a little bit more careful here. But this string 
actually includes a reference to a variable. Okay, and that's a pretty common thing to do in any programming language is you know, build variables using other variables. Nothing special here. All right, so that's our defaults file. Because we're on, the, on this topic of variables, um, let's have a look at the actual variables folder in this role. All right. Being a little bit silly there. Oh, one other thing that we do need to point out. The default YML file in any of these folders that need YML is called main.yml. That's what Ansible will look for. If you want to use a different name, you can. Um, but you'll need to use an include directive. You'll actually need to tell Ansible to include a particular file um, and you'll need to write that include directive in your main.yml. All right, so if I, let's see if we can get both of these on the screen here. It'll be close. Vars has two YML files in it, a debian.yml and a redhat.yml. Now, in last week's lecture, we we saw how CF Engine allowed you to use classes to um, define actions based on things like operating system. Ansible doesn't have that that syntactic sugar, as we call it. You have to be a little more manual in what happens. So, in this particular case, the author has created two variable files named by platform and he'll refer to those variable files later um, and he'll use a, a when clause to say you know if you're on red hat uh, or when you're on red hat use the red hat yml file include the red hat yml file but we'll have a look at that in a moment for now let's just have a look here and see if there's anything interesting about these yml files we'll look at this one Okay, um, there is something interesting here. The lead to those variables is two underscores. That's actually a Python convention. And that convention is this is a non-public, non-shared variable, a private. Um, it's a convention, it's not a requirement. Other than that, um, everything's pretty honky-dory. It's just standard variables. Okay. Let's move that to the side. Next, let's have a look at handlers. Let's see our handlers folder here. Hmm. We have two handlers, and handlers are uh, events that can be triggered. And they, they're used for things like restarting services after you've made a change to a configuration file. So what you'll find is when we look at our, um, our tasks later, somewhere there'll be a notification to restart Jenkins. Um, and Ansible collects all of those together so that you don't restart the same process more than once for multiple changes in a play in a playbook, sorry. Um, and that, that's kind of nifty. 
Um, apologies for the lack of spacing here, um, but if you have a look at this particular file on GitHub, um, the spacing will be correct. It's just a problem with the fonts on this machine. All right, anything special or interesting here? Mm, yes, there is. The register directive tells Ansible to capture the output from running this module or this task and put it in a variable. All right, in fact, we'll just call it Jenkins user config. So this is a way to, to capture error messages and the like. Kind of handy when you're trying to to move bits of data around and don't want to write a module. What goes in a meta directory? Meta is kind of interesting. Now this module is written to be a Galaxy module, so it has some extra metadata which we're not going to talk about. For our purposes, the module does have a dependencies variable. The dependencies variable allows Ansible to determine the order in which it's going to apply different roles. What this is saying is you must have already successfully completed uh, application of the guy.java role before you can apply this Jenkins role. Easy. Sorry, Mike, be before we move on, um, yes. got a question that might be quite relevant from Tony. Um, he's wondering whether that only works for CLI-based commands, not anything that uses a GUI. Uh, for the register. Um, okay, so register will capture your um, standard in, standard out. Um, you know, I suspect what will happen is if you're running this on Windows, it would still capture your exit code. Um, but I'd have to try that. Yeah, and Tony was talking about if this was running in Windows. Yeah. Um, it's going to depend on what you're actually running. So if, for, for an example, um, I, if you're just running a, um, well, what's, what's a useful Windows uh, module? Um, if you're running a PowerShell script, um, it will capture the output. That's, yeah, there's code in the, um, the connection plugin, the, sorry, the shells plugin to do that. Um, if you ran something that was CLI only, then the best it's going to be able to do is the, the return code um, assuming that it eats it. Um, if it, if it's um, trampolining, if it's starting another program and then exiting, um, you're not going to get the result of the other program, you'll only get the, the wrapper. Sorry, Tony, that's not a very useful answer, I don't think, but it's the best I can give you right now. No, that's all right. That's, thanks. Um, Tony, if, if you like, um, post post a more detailed question on the forums and we'll see about actually getting a minimum working example to figure out what happens. Awesome. All right. So that's meta. What else have we got to worry about here? Oh, yeah. Main.yml. Okay, so I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Apologies if this doesn't work as well as I hope. Okay, we're just going to focus. Okay, excellent. All right, so 
this is our main.yml.in tasks. So what we're going to see in this is a list of different module calls to um, control the setup of Jenkins. All right. So we have our first step is include OS specific variables. All right. Remember how we had our dbn.yml and our redhat.yml? This is where that's used. Now, how does Ansible know which platform we're on and how does our play figure that out? Well, Ansible has some built-in bags. One of which is the OS family that you're running on. All right. Now, to take those variables in, um, that's easy. That's what we've done here. Now we want to actually um, update our facts repository, which is you know, the in memory or usually in memory, but often now uh, in database store of our facts. And Ansible has a module that lets us do that. So we update our facts based on the variables that we pulled in from dbn.yml or redhat.yml. Now you may ask, well, what happens if I'm running this on FreeBSD? Um, the answer is pretty simple. The Ansible OS family uh, will say FreeBSD. Um, there will be no FreeBSD.yml. And so the include will fail. The play will stop. All right, we do some more back setting. Same again. All right, and now we do something a little bit different. Again, we're, we're interested in this OS family, but this time um, we're using the include module and we're going to import an entire YML file. It's a little bit different, but comparable to what's happening here. All right. And just more. All right. We have a service called Jenkins. Um, excuse my handwriting. Um, and this is really neat. This is the thing that I like the most about this role. It waits for Jenkins to start. It tries to connect to the Jenkins service. And what's really clever about this is it knows that any response it gets back from the Jenkins service is enough to say Jenkins is running because it's handled the web request. That's clever. All right. And we do a little bit more messing about here specific to setting up Jenkins. And Jenkins is a little bit weird. The first time you start it, um, you have to <sighs> answer some security stuff basically. Um, I haven't done this for a while, so. You know, you'll get to play with it soon enough, I'm sure. All right. Now, we included a particular set of tasks. So let's have a quick look at that redhat.yml file just as an example. All right. And this is kind of nifty.
install multiple packages. Okay, we make sure that the Jenkins repo is installed, which is where we'll get updates from for Jenkins. A little bit of key management. This is a very common thing. If you're not in a standard repo. Okay. And this is all pretty much standard stuff. Okay, well, I've had enough of reading through that role. Um, there's one more thing that we know we'd like to look at, and that's a template. Now, this is probably not going to work as well, just because it's a different font size, so I'll just... All right. A template is just a file. It may have some variables in it for expansion. That's it. It doesn't have to be HTML, even though Ginger 2 came from a HTML background. Right? It's just a file and Ginger 2 is a language um, to expand variables and put a little bit of, um, of code uh, in your, your templates. Um, there's nothing hard about this. Generally, what will happen is you'll take a config file for the system you're working with. You'll figure out what needs to be changed. You'll put placeholders in there for the variables. You'll go into your default folder and actually give default values for those variables. And then you'll work forward from there. And you're done. Okay. Now, um, what I will do with these um, diagrams and, and the notes that are written on them is I will scan those and post them to um, to the the MOOC to the Moodle install. Okay, that leaves us with very quickly. I'm going to flip back here to skim. All right. That leaves us with looking at playbook. Um, because we are running over and playbooks are, are actually pretty easy, we'll do it very quickly by hand. Name. Um, we go back very quickly to our static inventory. Um, let's hope I get this right. Um, our role is Ansible dash role dash Jenkins, that should get us there, I hope. Yeah, let me just, sorry, you, you won't be seeing that, so I'll just flip across, apologies. Uh, what just happened? Um, all right. So we have our hosts, we have the rules to be applied. Oops, we have a play. Awesome. Okay, uh, questions?
Christy Owens. Okay. Uh, There'll be hundreds, won't there? What have I messed up? <laughs> no, it's all been pretty good. Um, <laughs> actually, they're all going back to the earlier slides in the Ansible bracket. Um, one from Daniel, who's unfortunately had to leave the, the webinar. Um, what do you think of Mosh as an SSH edition in config management? Uh, <laughs> Mosh? Yeah. The, uh, as in mobile SSH? Oh, uh, I imagine so. It's, Can you red flag the question and I'll... Yeah, it's in there. Uh, it's from Daniel Holmes from, at 1244. 1244. 1244? Yep. Nope, I see. Okay. Um, if, if you... So... Uh, Dan, if if you're in an environment where you need Mosh because your connectivity is so poor, um, then you've probably got bigger problems in the environment than your SSH, uh, sorry, your config management. Um, one of the, the problems that you'll have using um, push-driven config management is losing connections. If you lose a connection, then the best you can hope for is that nothing is broken. If you can re-establish the connection, you'll have to start that entire playbook from scratch um, and hope that there's been no side effects. Um, Mosh doesn't really help you there. Um, it just means that you don't lose the connection, but you keep trying, so you're in this limbo. Um, I probably would avoid Mosh um, for at least using Ansible for config management. For general sysadmin, yeah, it's, it's great. Next. Next is uh, a question from Joel. Uh, does Ansible's agentless nature cause any scalability issues? He um, is wondering whether... Yes. yes ...without some government does. master node. <laughs> okay. He imagines uh, larger scales might get painful. Yeah. So um, it can be very painful. Um, one thing that uh, can help a little is to cheat using um, Ansible pull. And what Ansible pull does is it looks in a Git workspace, um, checks if there's been any changes to that workspace. Um, and if there have been, it pulls those changes down into the workspace and then runs a playbook um, based on the name of the host. Uh, or you can change that, but yeah, it basically runs that playbook. So what you're you're doing here is you're cheating a little bit. You're moving that load that you'd normally have for a master to push to a repo to serve. And if you've got a decent uh, Git infrastructure, um, that's that's going to work quite nicely. But you lose some of that control. Right? It's a trade-off. It's not a perfect solution. Um, it's also a little bit of a cop out, a little bit of a, a cheat, but it's, it's kind of an elegant one because, you know, most people nowadays are using some flavor of Git. There's, oh, there's still plenty of people using um, uh, 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 SourceSafe and, and Subversion and the like, and even Perforce, but you know, enough people are using Git that, that this is you know, not a bad thing. Um, on the minus side, you, you still have to get bootstrapped um, to get that running. And there's a little bit of extra work for you. Um, you know, if you're careful, you can integrate it with your branching and tagging policy. Um, I haven't seen it done well, but you know, there are people out there who are certainly better at this than I am. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, is Ansible still easy when you have all your devices behind, behind a NAT gateway device? E easy ah. in, uh, easy <laughs> in, in quotation marks. Um, short answer is uh, it, it can be. You're going to need to open up, um, put a port translation in. Um, what I would suggest that you do if you're in this situation is set up um, a single bastion host just running SSH 
and purely to allow you to bounce through that bastion. And that's the one you'll allow inbound SSH from outside, hopefully restricted um, to a small set of IPs. Um, and you'll pass through that host and then apply your changes. And it's a little bit annoying to get going. Uh, okay, not true. It's a lot annoying to get going. It's very fiddly, but once it's going, it just works. It's a little bit slower, um, especially if you're using Paramico. But once you get it right with all your um, SSH control masters, it's not that much worse than just having direct access to each machine individually. Um, so what we're talking about, I'll just flip back very quickly to the camera. Is doing this. Uh, let's just make sure it's coming up. Um, is the camera working? Yep. Excellent. All right. So we're talking about having an internet. And now who asked the question? Bloody hell, Mike, I don't know. Uh, that one was. No, I've lost it. I've re reprioritized it. Sorry. Okay, well. By War War Gateway. Running that. Ah, it was Daniel. Okay. Who, who, as I said, has left, but uh, still interesting question. Okay, that's cool. Um, so you have a bunch of nodes here. Um, we will designate one as a bastion or a jump box or a bounce, bounce host and different, has different names. So hole 122, hole 122, connection will go through here and hit your bounce box and your bounce box will then be responsible for getting you to each of these um, so you want to be using SSH proxy um, there are some recipes online that do this. Um, it, it is, as I said, it is fiddly to get going, um, but once it is going, it, it makes things a lot easier. Um, I have used this in production. It works well. Um, you know, as long as you're not in a hurry to have everything done within two or three seconds, because that initial setup is painful. All righty. Okay. Uh, and just a couple of questions for, uh, I suppose, not as experienced uh, players. Um, yep. A question about SSH, is that secure shell? Uh, do you want to give a quick outline yes, of what is. this is? And, and then um, uh, the, the section where you were using the, the document camera, um, Alexandra says, is there a... It's, is there a sort of a takeaway uh, that we can take from that section um, if, if they found it a little bit of an information overload with regard to specific examples? <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll tackle these questions uh, in reverse order. Um, yes, the, the takeaway is this. The basics are very easy to apply to roles that you'll find online. Right. You should read the roles that are out there that you want to use. Don't ever use them without reading them first. Um, at least have an understanding how they work. You just need to know a little bit of YAML and then you can sit down and work through the roles quite easily. And I'd encourage you to do that, Alexander. It's a really good way to learn is to read other people's code. Um, we don't do enough of that. Um, you know, I will, as I said, I will scan those uh, notes and the, PDF, the pieces of paper will come out on the, the forum somewhere. And in, in, in fact, Mike, as well. And, and in, on top Sorry? of that, the, 
on top of that, the amazing me has been recording your your document camera yes. uh, sessions, and we'll yes. splice that into the course record the, the lecture recording, which will be available in twenty four hours on oh, the on your master's page. Awesome, thank you, Mia. Assuming no stuff ups. <laughs> ah, it's Mia. There won't be any. Yeah. Okay. So that takes us back to the earlier question, which is, what is SSH? Um, SSH is a reasonably secure way to connect to a remote computer, so that you can log into that computer and get a, a an interactive session. So. SSH is kind of like the uh, Unix Linux equivalent of RDP if it was done properly and it was secure. Um, it uses encryption. Um, it has a reasonable model for exchanging keys. It's not great, um, but that's a, that's more of a reality of key exchange being a hard problem than SSH getting it wrong. Um, the big win with SSH is it's pretty much everywhere on Linux, Unix, OS X. Um, you know, if you're an Apple user and you switch on uh, remote sharing, um, it's SSH that goes on. Um, if you're on Windows and you've ever used PuTTY, PuTTY is a Windows implementation of the SSH client. Um, SSH server is a little bit harder to get running on Windows. If you're using Ansible on Windows, then you'd um, probably not bother with SSH at all. You'd simply just stick with WinRM, um, which is you know very very much like SSH for Windows. Um, SSH is wonderful. It solves a whole bunch of problems. Um, people can't sniff passwords if you're logging into work on a machine. That's kind of important. You don't want them to get the master password, the root password. Um, the other nice thing with SSH is as you play with it, um, you can actually set it up to tunnel connection. So you can point your browser through your SSH connection to a, a web browser running, a web server running on a different machine that you've connected to. Um, and it's kind of like a, a little private proxy, very nifty. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, one section to go. How How's that for time? We've got 45 minutes over. Uh, real easy. Beauty. Because we've pretty much covered most of it already. Great. All right. We've talked about abstraction. So this is mostly going to be revision. The whole point of abstraction is to help you understand, to encapsulate what we call encapsulate complexity. Wrap complexity up with a nice label. Um, and hopefully the label's a good one so that you understand in general terms what's happening. So that if you don't need to go into something, you don't have to, right? Um, we, abstraction happens around us all the time. You log on to your computer, you call it a log on, but you don't necessarily know what's happening behind that. All you care about is you can log on, right? A web browser is, is an abstraction too. You, know, you don't have to care that it's HTML and complex on the back end because the web browser hides all that for you. Right? Abstraction is really good because if you get it right, it helps with scale. Right? And in fact, as, as I said earlier in the class, um, you know, if you think about roles in Ansible as a form of abstraction, um, roles are also our main basis for reusability. So that abstraction uh, directly lets us start thinking about reusability. Um, it's kind of important for bootstrapping. You know, abstraction is a way of bootstrapping. You build more complex things up from simpler things underneath it until eventually you get to something that's quite complex, um, but you don't have to know how it works. You know, think about a car. Um, you know, just the wheels are built out of you know, rubber and metal. The metallurgy, the, the science in the metal is very complex. Um, rubber a little less so, um, but you need both of those to have this thing called a rubber wheel a tire. The thing with all of this is even though it looks simpler, the, the complexity is still there. It hasn't disappeared. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I think 
uh, IT workers will actually still have jobs going forward. Config management won't get rid of those jobs because somebody still has to understand the complexity that's really happening. All right, there are a bunch of abstractions out there. Cloud is an abstraction for a computer. It just happens to not be in your office, not be in your computer room, it's in somebody else's. A machine that does something is an abstraction for all the processes behind that something. Even your can is an abstraction. And that end of abstraction is the stuff we've all talked about. Don't, don't underestimate the importance of talking about this stuff with your team. Um, if you get it wrong, it's going to hurt you. But if you get it right, everyone will be on the same page. And that's going to have really, really positive benefits going forward. And that's it. We've run way over time. I blame Rob. Um, that's it for tonight. That seems Unless fair. Anybody has questions? <laughs> uh, no, there's no, que no more questions flooding in, uh, which is nice. But we've still got probably three quarters of the attendees still here. So that's, that's really good. Thanks, everyone. for. Thank you, everyone, for your patience tonight. No, it's... Mike, you know, you're going in depth. It's, 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 I think, quite a good thing. Uh, but we do understand if you do need to log off early, folks, and you rest assured that the recordings are always going to be there about 24 hours later, including this one. So uh, I guess. Um, I did want to just say something uh, very quickly, Guy. Um, yeah, go. Kind of administrivia, kind of not. Um, looking at the forums, uh, I am absolutely ecstatic about the discussion that's happening on the forums. Um, I wasn't expecting a lot of discussion, let alone the level and interaction that's there. And I think it's fantastic that people are doing this. Um, and I'm, I'm just really, really, really happy about that. I just wanted to say everyone, thank you for those discussions. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great forum. <laughs> pardon the pun for uh, uh, yeah, just that collaborative learning environment is really good. We love it. Um, yeah, so I guess all to say is thanks very much to Robert and, and you, Mike, from ITPA. Um, thank you, Mia, as always, um, for being the glue that keeps us stuck together. And yeah, thank you, everyone, for your attendance tonight. <laughs>